The Kawasaki KLR650 is incredibly old-fashioned, beyond slow, and brain-numbingly boring. Pair that with the fact that there is a plethora of better options to choose from, and you can see why I hate them. Except that apparently, not everyone feels the same way as I do about the KLR from John Deere's sister company. In fact, they seem to have a bit of a cult following, which I just can't wrap my head around. So, I bought one. Because what better way to figure out why some people appreciate a bike than to own one yourself and experience the thrills of ownership, or more likely, disappointment. Two things happened in 1998. I was born, and so was the Yamaha R1, which I like to think was no coincidence. But sadly, 24 years later, that R1 isn't very cutting edge anymore. Hence why Yamaha has moved on about seven times since then. And yet, 11 years before that in 87, Kawasaki was already producing the KLR 650 and wouldn't bother changing it much for a whopping 21 years. So just as the original KLR turned old enough to drink in the US, the second generation emerged in 2008. Looking very different, but not much better. Often being called the ugliest bike ever made, with a face only its mother could love, a park bench for a seat, unimaginative mirrors, and a chunky tail that was still stuck in the 80s along with a dash to match. But that's all subjective, believe it or not. But what isn't subjective is its engine. The KLR 650 is the antithesis of performance. Smaller pistons can move up and down faster, creating more power. Hence why Supersports spread their 600ccs across four pistons. But the KLR has its entire 650ccs in one big piston, earning it the title of a big thumper, because that big heavy piston casually chugs along more like a diesel tractor than a motorbike. And that's not just a rude joke. The US military actually used KLRs that were modified to run on diesel and other military spec fuels, cementing its title as a tractor. Except that even tractors have electronic fuel injection, unlike the KLR. And tractors also make more than 42 horsepower, and sometimes way less too. So this is my KLR. And yes, it is bigger than me. It's a relatively new one as a 2013 model, which means it has a much better looking black frame, swing arm and engine cases. It's a spring chicken with only 32,000 kilometers on it and is in pristine condition. I don't think it's ever been taken off road, but don't worry, I'll fix that. It has this no name brand silencer that I rather like because it looks much better than the stock one and isn't too loud or annoying. Not that there's a good soundtrack to be unleashed anyway. It does have a DB killer in it, but I'm not actually going to mess with that, because then I would probably have to fiddle with the carburetor to get it to run as well as it currently does, and I'm more of a smart carb kind of guy than a 1987 carburetor guy. And believe it or not, this is not only the first Kawasaki that I've ever owned, but in fact, the first Kawasaki I've ever even ridden. I have no idea what took me so long, but I can finally say that I've owned a bike from each of the big four Japanese manufacturers. And to be honest, I'm kind of glad it's green so that it's more authentic. So with a KLR now sitting in my workshop, I had no reason not to take it for a ride and figure out what it's all about. Because believe it or not, I didn't just instantly click with it on the ride home from the dealership. In fact, I was dreading getting back on it. So it's obvious then why I don't like them. They're old and Kawasaki hasn't bothered to update them in about three decades. They have a dull engine that makes no power and they look awful. But what isn't as obvious is why some people do like them. After scouring KLR forums, of which there were quite a lot, someone from somewhere around the world had tried to use one for just about every task you could possibly think of. But a few uses were constant throughout all the forums. <sighs> oh, 
Oh good, a dual sport. A jack of all trades. A master of none. This is my beloved Yamaha MT-09. And it's one of the best bikes in the world to commute on, in my opinion. And I can't possibly see how the KLR could even come close. But nevertheless, I'm going to commute on each of these bikes to my workshop to see which one is the most sensible choice for the job. By design, commuting is rather boring. First, I set a base time with the MT-09. I left home, went down a road, waited at a red light, navigated a roundabout, rode over a bridge, then under a bridge, made a turn and went up the hill to my workshop, all while sticking to the speed limit and in a blistering time of 9 minutes and 11 seconds. The next day I left home again, went down that same road, got lucky at that traffic light, and even on this, the speed limits held me back. So at least matching the MT-09's time seemed within reach. Except that speed limits only exist on paved roads. And I knew a not so paved shortcut to the workshop. This is a route I learned from spending hours messing around here on a dirt bike. The dirt section allowed me to be flat out. But then there was a long paved stretch with an agonizingly slow 30 km per hour speed limit eating into my advantage and no way around it. I took a shortcut through the trees and the abandoned parking lot to try and make up the time I'd lost. And before I knew it, I was heading up the hill to my workshop, feeling quietly confident. So apparently my so-called shortcut wasn't actually shorter because it ended up taking me two minutes longer to get here on the KLR than on the MT-09. But to be honest, I would happily sacrifice a mere two minutes every day if my commute could be that entertaining. Of course, that is ignoring the fact that I don't usually have video evidence of my ride to the workshop on the MT-09. So it may or may not be much faster than that and a lot more fun. But despite being slower, I do have to give the KLR credit where credit's due, because that is a pretty good way to get to work in the morning and to wake you up. Before we tour Africa on this bike, I do want to make a few quick changes to make it a bit more comfortable. And this way, I'll also get to embrace the culture of DIY modding that KLR owners have in the process. The previous owner got me started with this very DIY windscreen. It's literally bolted to the stock windscreen with some very janky bolts. Technically, any bike can be DIY modified. The only difference is that you'd probably feel bad about doing this to your brand new R1250 GS. There we go, much better. I do appreciate the extra wind protection from the screen, however, I'm absolutely shorter than the previous owner because this screen was sitting exactly in my line of sight. So combine this screen with my tinted visor and I was pretty much just squint. Then if you're planning on touring, you're probably gonna need some luggage. But a KLR rider doesn't shop at a bike shop, they shop at a hardware store. So this is a knockoff Pelican case. They're waterproof, lockable, rugged as hell, and come in various sizes to be the perfect DIY top box. Quick release mounting brackets are expensive and unnecessary for me. Four bolts get it attached to the rack in a few minutes. A rack that stresses it's only up for 10 kilograms. So we won't take advantage of it, but it will still get the weight of my camera backpack off my back. And finally, we'll need a phone mount to be able to navigate Africa, with a much needed vibration damper for obvious reasons. And that's about all the DIY modding I'm up for today. Research long rides into out of the way places and KLRs will pop up. I mean, I thought riding mine to my workshop was enough time spent on it. Why on earth would you want to travel the world on one? Apparently, it all comes back to that dull engine once again. But this time, excusing it. Because fewer cylinders equal fewer moving parts throughout. 
lowering potential problems. It's the same reason for the lack of electronics and luxuries, less to go wrong. That one big piston is so lazy that it only revs to 7,500, but that means it never works hard enough to run into any problems. It's basically the Toyota Hilux of motorcycles, indestructible. <laughs> but that is by no means saying that this is a flawless bike. The big single does vibrate quite a lot. And Kawasaki couldn't update these during this period because then they wouldn't be able to pass emission laws. So as a result, it's not as fuel efficient as it could be. And if you want any luxuries like cruise control or heated grips, that is one of those DIY mods you'll have to do yourself. But on this ride, I learned more about my own problems than the KLRs. My biggest issue is that I'm always in a rush. And that clashes with the KLR because it's physically incapable of rushing. Even if you can get it going flat out, you'll regret it. Because the frame starts wiggling around, scaring you to death. To be honest, it wasn't a bad place to be. Hiding behind that janky windscreen in a very neutral riding position even if the corners of that square seat do dig in rather quickly. To my surprise, I even had a hint of fun in the corners, which was the last thing I expected from the skyscraper with a 21-inch front wheel. However, bumping into that wallowy frame again, if going even slightly fast. But I did accidentally discover its real purpose in life. It's the speed bump king. The observant amongst you might have noticed that we haven't exactly toured Africa today. But technically, when you live there, every ride is touring Africa. I will reluctantly admit that I can now see the appeal of a top box for the first time ever. I've never been able to ride for more than about 40 minutes without my heavy backpack finding the perfect vertebrae to take hostage. And somewhere on this ride, the KLR tricked me into enjoying a very different ride than I'd normally do all without rushing. Tourist purists would argue that a real indestructible dual sport needs a drive shaft and not a chain and sprocket, so that you don't have to adjust and lube your chain every single night. But that would be like ditching the carb for Kawasaki. Expensive. Again, a specific generation will argue that a carburetor is essential so that when it stops working in the middle of Timbuktu, you could at least dismantle it and clean it out unlike with an injector. And I'm not gonna argue, I wouldn't know where to begin with a faulty injector. But these days, fuel injection is very reliable. More reliable than carburetors. This is the type of trail that I pegged the KLR to be able to handle. Smooth, predictable, boring. And to its credit, it doesn't struggle with them. But after a closer look, it actually has a few aspects that suggest it might be more competent than I first thought. It has a big 21 inch front wheel to help it get over obstacles easier, just like you'd find on a dirt bike. A window of 20 centimeters to search for traction up front before you bottom out, and 18 centimeters in the rear. Spoked wheels that can take an impact without getting mangled. And the best part is, there's no ABS. Some things were better in 1987 then. And then this one also has crash bars because it knows I'm going to screw up imminently. And it also has some hand guards so that I pull the brake at the wrong time and not the bushes I ride through. In this environment, I almost forgot how boring the KLR is. Not because it finally comes into its own, but because here you have to pay attention to get the best out of it, and that's rather entertaining. It doesn't immediately feel like a native, because it's the heaviest and least responsive bike I've ever ridden off-road. But that did require my full attention, especially combined with my weaker grasp on the ground, and certainty that I couldn't lift it off myself should I need to. But the biggest issue wasn't even Kawasaki's fault. It was whoever put these road bias tires on it, which did leave me stranded searching for traction a couple of times. The same person also decided to bend the handlebars, which made things more interesting and bothered me every time I looked down at them. 
So although it wouldn't be my first choice for a day off-road, it did make me smile at least twice. Because the thing about riding off-road is that you don't need 150 horsepower to have fun. A more responsive engine, maybe, but not more power. And when everyone else was loading up their bikes to head home, I just rode mine. The last piece of the KLR puzzle is actually the first thing you'll find out if you ever look into buying one. And that's the fact that they're dirt cheap. I paid just $2,800 for that chunk of motorcycle. And suddenly all of its shortcomings not only don't matter, but don't even exist anymore. When you don't have a lot of money to spend on a bike, reliability matters even more. You don't need an exciting bike to commute with, what you need is something cheap comfortable and that will get through traffic quicker than a car. For $2,800 you wouldn't expect to find a bike that can tour your continent and get up to the highway speed limit. It explains the DIY modding culture. It's the cheapest way and taking an angle grinder to a $2,800 bike isn't as frightening as taking one to a $28,000 bike. And the fact that it can even survive off-road for that price is incredible. What's held it back throughout everything I've done with it in my opinion is its dull engine, but they can't change it. If they made it a parallel twin for example, it would be more like the Yamaha T7, and then it would need the suspension and tech to compete, and then it would lose the only thing that makes it stand out to begin with, its price tag. So perhaps I don't hate the KLR anymore. In fact, I respect it. I'm even glad Kawasaki still makes it, but I'm not going to keep mine either. To be honest, I kinda started liking them before any of this began, just from researching them. And I thought it might be exactly what I've been after for a while now, a budget adventure bike. But this just doesn't have the right character. It definitely has character of sorts, just not akin to my own. It's not trying to compete with any other bikes in terms of performance, because it already beats them where they can't compete. And that's why when Kawasaki finally did update the KLR this year in 2022, after completely killing them off in 2018, the biggest upgrade was giving them electronic fuel injection. The absolute bare minimum to make them legal, while still maintaining that ridiculously low price tag. 